Thanks very much, um, Kayleen. And I want to acknowledge that we're on Ghana land and, if, and pay my respects. Well, I'm on Ghana land today speaking to you from Ghana land and uh, pay my respects to Ghana elders past and present. And if you don't know where Flinders is, we're in South Australia. And I also want to say thank you very much to Kayleen for inviting me to be part of this event. I feel really humbled to be uh, included in a lineup of such outstanding speakers. And as you can all see, I've been really enjoying myself so far, um, loving, loving the sessions and only hoping that I can live up to the quality that's already uh, gone before me. So today I want to talk about future mobility challenges in a cyber physical world, law, ethics and connected autonomous vehicles. And just about an hour ago, I, I got a tweet comes through on Twitter um, I was con about the Tesla accident in Melbourne just the other day. Um, and uh, I was contacted by The Age for some comment on that. And it's always so interesting that uh, the comments that you give them and the comments that appear in the final article in the paper are, <laughs> are um, perhaps not the, the comments that you were focusing on, but there you are. So when I want to acknowledge that this presentation builds on previous presentations that I've given with a colleague, uh, Nick Reid, to the National Transport Commission and also to uh, ADBI, the Australia and New Zealand Driverless Vehicles Initiative, but I have developed it further. So when we're thinking about the cyber physical context and we're thinking about mobility and future mobility, safety is obviously critical and ethics become really important. And usually when people uh, start talking to me about driverless cars, the first issue that's rolled out on just about every occasion is the trolley problem. Uh, who are you going to hit? Are you going to hit the grandma or are you going to hit the kids or are you going to hit, you know, the four people over here or the one person over there? But as um, Bonifon and others have noted, and I'll come to the, to the report shortly, Sacrificial dilemmas like the trolley problem really are unrealistic. Uh, for a start, as human beings, we don't have the capacity usually in the short space of time to go through all of those ethical analyses. And really those, those trolley problems are unrepresentative of the moral situations that, yes, thank you, that people encounter in the real world. So. When we frame discussions around the ethics of automated vehicles in the context of the trolley problem, what we're doing is setting it in an absurdist context, if you like, an artificial context, and then that can shape the way that people approach the situation and decide what to do. But really, there are a whole lot of much broader questions that are raised uh, and I'm citing here briefly from a paper written by a colleague of mine, Leon Kester, and some other co-authors. So Leon and his co-authors have said that let's put the let's put the trolley problem to one side as artificial. But he's also calling for uh, a practicable, technically oriented, and at the same time forward-looking solution. How are we going to manage responsible use? of advanced artificially intelligent systems. And I want to say right at the beginning here that we're talking about code and we're talking about machine operating in ways that it's been coded to do. We're not talking about intelligence. We're just talking about machines. If we're going to think about what we mean by connected automated vehicle, what I'm talking about in this context is vehicles with automated driving systems. Um, and the Society for Automotive Engineers has an international standard, which has just been updated. Um, and, and really their definition there is hardware and software that are collectively capable of performing the entire dynamic driving task, uh, regardless of, of whether we're just within a specific operational design domain or not and that are connected then over uh, networks to a variety of other devices, networks, infrastructure, et cetera. It's worth noting at this point that um, many of the late model vehicles that many of us already drive have advanced driver assistance systems that when they operate, in fact, override the human driver. But I'm not talking about that 
for these purposes. I'm talking about an automated, autom automated vehicle which has a, a system that can do the entire dynamic driving task. So we're not yet there. So as part of my interest in this area, I've um, become involved with the Australia and New Zealand Driverless Vehicles Initiative, and in fact, I sit on their policy and risk group. Uh, and also I sit on the National Transport Commission's Automotive Vehicles Industry Insight Group and um, have authored with uh, colleagues Mark Brady, Kylie Burns and Kieran Tranter, piece on uh, personal injury compensation and also a, a sole authored article um, around advanced driver assistance systems and how we manage those before we get to the fully automated stage. And I've been puddling away here in Australia on these issues. Uh, and at the other side of the world, in Europe, uh, in the last few years, there has been some work uh, by a high level um, group of independent experts that have developed uh, this report, Ethics of Connected and Automated Vehicles. Um, and this report builds on existing reports such as um, the EU's AI high-level expert group guidelines for trustworthy AI, the European Group on Ethics and Science and New Technologies, and their statement on artificial intelligence, robotics and auto autonomous systems, uh, the Ethics Task Force report, and the expert group in the EU on liability and new technologies. So this group had done uh, a significant amount of work and they applied what they called a responsible and research innovation approach to connected and automated vehicles. They recognised the potential of this technology to deliver significant benefits. And I want to just put in brackets here the data from Australia and the data from the US uh, is consistent. And that is that at least 93% of motor vehicle accidents are caused by human error. And, me, and the vast majority of those in Australia are people failing to keep a proper lookout for what's happening in front of them, and so rear-end collisions. And in fact, in Australia, what we see is many, many of the uh, fatalities that we um, unfortunately uh, suffer in Australia are sole uh, vehicle, single vehicle accidents on straight roads in uh, rural and remote regions. So. Um, we lose about 1,200 people a year who die as, as incidents of, of road trauma. Um, and of course, we have about 40,000 serious injuries a year. And the last figures that were estimated, uh, I think were 2017, a cost of about $27 billion from road trauma um, annually when you take into account all of the ripple effects of that. So yes, there's huge potential, as we see already in the cars now with advanced driver assistance systems in increasing safety from our vehicle. The data around electronic stability control and airbags shows that um, there has been about a 23 to 24% reduction in um, injuries as a result of those of those accidents. So yeah, huge potential for huge benefits to society. But what this European report suggested was if we're going to realise the potential, we need to think not only about the technical aspects, but a broader, broader set, of course, of ethical, legal and societal considerations. And we need to build that in to what we might call the deployment journey for connected automated vehicles. So the report's handed down uh, a number of uh, considerations and really broadly into three chapters, looking at road safety, risk and dilemmas, looking at data and algorithmic ethics, privacy, fairness and explainability, all those chapter two issues that we've been talking a lot about today, and chapter three, responsibility. There was an independent group of 14 experts from ethics, law and from some of the engineering type disciplines. What they also uh, held as a part of the preparation of this report 
was a number of stakeholder workshops. I think they held, held about six or seven of those during the course of the preparation report. And that brought together a, a really wide range of researchers, policy makers, uh, in motoring association manufacturers, um, uh, engineers, civil engineers, electronic engineers, uh, programmers, etc., as part of these um, stakeholder workshops. And they all informed the outcome of this report. And I should also say in brackets, the National Transport Commission has been doing huge work here in, in Australia on some of these issues. It's not my purpose today to talk about the NTC's uh, reports, although they have just recently, um, just in the last week or so, I've been notified that our transport ministers nationally have agreed on an approach uh, and a new issues paper has been released. But for, for now, I'm just focusing on what's happening in Europe. So as part of that report, they came down with 20 recommendations and those, those recommendations addressed issues around safety, issues around transparency and issues around responsibility. One of those under the category of safety was to consider revision of traffic rules to promote safety and really to explore further whether connected automated vehicles should be allowed not to comply with a traffic rule. And this is the from the report. It says the researchers should study the extent to which it's reasonable to expect that an intelligent non-human system is able to engage in the complex process of evaluation of the interpretation of a legal, ethical or societal norm and its balancing with another norm, value or principle. So really, that's the sort of thing that the trolley problem gets us to try and consider. How are we going to balance this obligation with this obligation? So the, the, the report goes on to say, researchers should also test the ex post explainability of these decisions and pursuit of comfort or efficiency shouldn't be considered a justification for non-compliance. So... We had the European report. I was doing my work here in Australia. And uh, as a result of that, Nick Reid contacted me and said, let's do some work following up that recommendation four that uh, the EU Commission had put forward. And so with a really <laughs> interesting multidisciplinary group, uh, so Nick Reid, who was formerly at Bosch, is, an is a mobility engineer, um, so come and, and road safety expert with Paula Pallard, who's a chief uh, electronics engineer at Jaguar Land Rover in the UK, uh, Marika Martins and Leon Kester, who are both academics working in the human factors, um, mobility research, and also Leon in the AI and safety and meta ethics field. And me as a lawyer, we came together and spent quite a considerable amount of time, I think about 18 months, working on this paper, which was published at the end of last year. And I want to talk a little bit about some of our uh, analysis in this. Um, and I have to confess, I'm the lawyer as part of this very multidisciplinary group. And so when it comes to some of the nuances here around the programming, um, you know, I have to defer to to uh, my colleagues, particularly to Leon Kester, and I'm still grappling with some of these ideas to try and really understand it. So we followed on from the EU report and we started with this question. When should it be considered appropriate for an automated vehicle to deviate from expected driving behaviours in the interest of road safety? Now, that's a very broad question. And so building on the discussions from the expert stakeholder workshops, we decided to de confine our analysis to two key areas. When is it okay to exceed the speed limit or when should it be okay for an automated vehicle to exceed the, exceed the speed limit? When should it be okay for an automated vehicle to mount the curb? Now, because we were, I was working with a group of EU colleagues, we looked at the law from the UK. So in the UK, Road traffic regulation says, yes, it's an offence uh, if you drive a vehicle at a, 
at a speed exceeding a limit that's been imposed. But that Regulation Act links very closely to the UK's Highway Code. And when you look at the Highway Code, it says it doesn't mean that it's safe to drive at this speed in all conditions. So, of course, we have to think about how we're going to code a vehicle to know how it should behave in particular circumstances. It can only drive up to the limit, but that doesn't always mean that it's going to be safe. If we look at um, the uh, provision around driving on a roadway, it says that um, you should not drive anywhere other than on a roadway, except if you have a look at the exception, it's not an offence if you do so for the purpose of saving life or for extinguishing fire or meeting any other like emergency. And then, of course, if we think about the definition of um, dangerous driving, something's dangerous driving if it falls far below what would be expected of a competent and careful driver, and it would be obvious to a competent and careful driver that driving in that way would be dangerous, and how do we know? And then it says competent, we, we have to think about what would be expected of a competent, careful and driver um, having regard to all of the circumstances and all the circumstances that they would be expected to be aware of and that they actually knew about. So what we can draw from that very, very quick survey of just a few uh, traffic rules that apply in the UK is that even apparently simple rules, uh, road rules around speed, road rules about not leaving the roadway or not driving on the curb, embed elements of discretion. And those of us who drive motor vehicles and those of us like me who ride an electric bike, we're always exercising discretion to ensure that we comply with the road rules. But it's very challenging to think about what that means for how connected and automated vehicles operate and how we can design a machine to manage the sorts of discretion that we use all the time. So let's just think about breaches of the road rules by human drivers. Those of us who drive motor vehicles will regularly drive slightly over the speed limit, or we may uh, turn through a yellow light after we, or a red light when, when um, we shouldn't have, or we might park in the wrong place, or we might do all sorts of breaches ranging from the very minor to you know, a serious breach. But the vast majority of things that we do on the road that don't comply exactly with the road rules never lead to being charged with a breach of the road rules. So it's most likely that we won't be charged unless we've, our actions have been observed directly by the police or reported to them by someone else. And then even then, um, it's less likely that we would be charged unless our breach impacts others. And of course, when it comes to thinking about um, police or other traffic authorities, they always have prosecutorial discretion. And so they may choose to exercise that, give us a, a formal warning, an informal warning, or counsel us or tell us, hey, you better go and get that rear light fixed up because um, you know it's not working and we don't want to defect your vehicle. But when we're thinking about connected automated vehicles, the data being generated by those vehicles and collected by those vehicles has potential to identify every single breach. So every single time, every single moment the vehicle exceeds the speed, that can be identified in the data. Every single time the vehicle veers off a roadway, again, that can be identified. Now, if we're thinking about breaches of traffic rules, we know that uh, they may, any breach may lead to uh, criminal liability or traffic a traffic offence, but it also may lead to civil liability if, unfortunately, we crash into somebody else or injure somebody. What we know, of course, is that people are much more likely to litigate or contest charges 
if there is a lack of clarity around exactly what the elements of the offence are or whether the person who's been charged or sued says, well, in fact, in the circumstances, I exercised discretion which I should have exercised because it was a, an emergency, because I had to avoid someone else, etc. So explainability, as we've been talking about so much today and yesterday, explainability in this context is crucial. Humans rely on explainability all the time. Um, and if we're thinking about how we might use technology effectively in this context, explainability will be crucial as well. But we should always keep asking ourselves here, what objective is the regulatory framework seeking to achieve? Uh, and what other options might there be to achieve that uh, objective? So when my European colleagues um, raised these questions with the stakeholder groups as part of that EU ethics report, there was no agreement from industry experts and there was a very wide spectrum of views about whether or not automated vehicles should be allowed to breach the law. So some people said, no, breach should never be permitted. Some were prepared to say, well, yes, you can breach, you could breach the speed limit if you needed to overtake someone so that you could be safe or, you know, there was some other reason. Yes, you could, could leave the, the road and mount the curb if you had to avoid colliding with blah, blah. Um, some industry experts, industry and experts were prepared to say, okay, well, we need general principles and others wanted to have specific descriptions about when uh, you were permitted to breach the law and when you were not. And when we analysed those views, what you what you could see from those responses was that um, those views reflected very different perspectives about what the risks that behaviour posed, how reasonable responses might be. So is it okay to exceed the speed limit by 5Ks? Well, maybe, but not if you're in a school zone. Um, so is it is it reasonable to exceed the speed limit by 10 k's well maybe if you're on a motorway but not if you're a built-up area you know so those types of things start to become very very nuanced and what sort of level of of safety do they pose and of course the refu the, the views reflected a whole lot of different perspectives and assumptions about just how capable the vehicles and their operating systems would be and <laughs> Whether or not that was true uh, was, was also um, up for debate. So when people are coming to think whether or not the law should, should be allowed to be broken, they're coming from a position of making a whole lot of assumptions that may or may not be valid. So the conclusion from all of that is that if the objective of speed limits and rules that say that you need to drive a motor vehicle on the road are about achieving optimal road safety. If you program vehicles to comply exactly with those rules, then that may not necessarily achieve optimal road safety. So the highway code says, well, it might, yes, the, the speed limit might be here, but in fact, the conditions might suggest that you can only drive to this limit to be safe. And the the, um, the insights from, particularly from Marika Martins and Leon Kester, um, who work in this space and think about programming, is that it's, it's in, inordinately difficult to program for discretion. The only way that you can program for discretion is to anticipate every possible situation where you not, might need to, dis, to exercise discretion and then program for that, and you simply can't in the context of traffic because we know that environmental conditions, the amount of other traffic and other road users varies dramatically, not only between geographical domains, but between time of day, between weather conditions, all those sorts of things. So there's no training set of data that can exhaust all possibilities and allow for programming for discretion. So let's just come back to some broad high-level uh, principles here. We know that road rules are a means by which road safety is achieved and our core principle here and our core 
value is to keep people um, safe on the roads. But we also know that sometimes we have to breach those rules to achieve greater safety. So we might have to veer up onto the curb or the, the footpath if we need to get out of the way of an oncoming emergency vehicle, for example. But we also know, and particularly this is evident when you review all the data that Google posts about all the incidents with the Waymo vehicles, that where automated vehicles don't behave absolutely predictably, and that's predictability from a human perspective, then that can compromise uh, the other human users around who are expecting predictable behaviour rather than 100% compliant behaviour. So from a systems engineering perspective then, how could an automated vehicle determine when society is going to expect it to depart from absolute compliance with those rules? How do we know when a connected vehicle, connected automated vehicle needs to prioritise safety. We can't escape from the fact that this raises ethical questions about the relative value that society places on the responses. Now, that may sound like the trolley problem, but it's not. So what we do know is that, and I'm using AI as a, as a shortened here, although I, as I've already said, I'm not a fan of the word intelligence in this context. AI systems can't derive ambiguous human values from data sets. And they can't say, all right, well, people have valued that sort of behaviour here, so I'm going to transfer that to a completely different domain, different conditions. Even if we have got sufficiently large tra uh, training data sets, um, the, the programs can't develop underlying ethical principles and we can't learn how to apply discretion. So what we argue in our paper is that what needs to be developed here is something that Leon Kester particularly calls an ethical goal function. How are we going to place priorities of the sorts of goals that we want these machines to achieve? And the, the challenge particularly that's coming from industry and particularly from industries like Bosch and from Jaguar Land Rover is we have the programmers, the engineers saying, tell us how we should program these machines. If you don't tell us, we'll be responsible, but we don't want the responsibility. We want you, community, to tell us. And if we don't tell them, then the program will make those decisions. And whether or not society agrees with that is going to be a really important question. And so what we argue in our paper is that uh, those ethical goal functions have to represent the need or the will of society rather than that of the developers who are simply doing the programming. And that, of course, then raises real questions about how we, how we arrive at an inclusive or public deliberative approach for development of those ethical goal functions how are we going to have a conversation about how we can achieve safety? What we're going to value more highly than other things? How are we going to inform our citizens? Because if our citizens aren't um, of the view that they agree with how these vehicles operate, then they're likely to lack confidence in adopting them. Or every time there's a collision, uh, they're going to point to the fact that these this technology is useless and I shouldn't use it. And we, we see that in relation to the to the Tesla accident just a couple of days ago. Oh, it wasn't my fault. It was the it was the technology. And yet we know that we've got potential to create significant safety benefits. So how should that be achieved? So what we call for in our paper is cohesive action by regulators, developers, and researchers to actually start having the conversation about how we might formulate an ethical goal or an ethical utility function that represents what our society agrees is acceptable behaviour and that then can be integrated successfully into automating driving systems that are being developed. And really just to finish, 
We've got many disciplines talking different languages. We've got people pushing um, responsibility for outcomes onto different people who are all part of the process of putting a vehicle on the road. How can we connect together, talk together, so that we can uh, bring to bear the anticipated benefits? So thanks for your interest. Thanks, Kate.